Hey, what's going on guys? I'm going to talk about handguns today because I've been asked, a lot of women ask me about new gun education. What's interesting is I think men also want to know that they just don't ask as much. So I'm going to give you a basic understanding of what to look for when you're selecting a gun. Now, the first thing that most people consider is what is everybody else using to choose the model, manufacturer, even caliber, whether it's novels, eh, models, novels, books, Hollywood, um, or tactical experts. Instructors do have an understanding of some of the best guns and, and what their best use is, but some of it could be biased because of their experiences. Like if I told you what I think you should choose, that would be based off of most of my experience in special operations, but also GRS. I carried a Glock 17 appendix carried center line of my body for almost my entire career in special operations. So I'm partial to Glock, but a lot of people don't know the start point for why that's a good option. I thought it was cool because it looked cool. As a kid, um, I knew it was that, that gun you can get through the airport security before all the stuff happened on 9-11 and it was known for that and it, it had controversy. So it became super popular in Hollywood, but is it the right pistol for you? So we'll talk about some of that stuff. I have in front of me a SIG and an HKP7, which are bad examples um, because they're my guns, but they'll give, a, give you an idea of kind of the best options for you. So if you were to ask me and you said, hey Mike, I wanna get a pistol for self-defense, man, woman, whatever, the first thing I would do is have you hold up your hand. I would have you do this because I want to compare your hand with mine to see if your hand's smaller than mine. If it is, then I want to turn you on to a gun that's going to fit well in your hand. First, let's talk about nomenclature. Nomenclature for pistols is classified as, and there's going to be some nomenclature Nazis, I get it. Uh, I'm talking layman's terms here. Compact and full size. Let's skip the subcompact. You got small guns and big guns. So an example of a big gun is this SIG P320X carry. This is a full size gun, big gun. A small gun considered a compact will be something like this very expensive HKP7. Not the best choice for most people. Uh, I think these are like four grand. I, I think it's... It's an iconic gun, but it has particular things to it that I'll tell you about that is the reason that I have this. If you're doing a full-size gun for carry, then the limitations are obvious. It's big. It's going to stand out. But if you're a 120-pound woman trying to conceal this gun, more of a problem. If you're like me, you're a big white guy, white guy, um, it's not going to be that much of an issue. I mean, this way center line of my crotch is not going to be a lot of signature. Now, if I had a base plate, like this magazine, I have an extension for a base plate. Yeah, it might be problematic. So, like I said, I carried a Glock 17 my entire career, and it's about the same size as this. Why would I opt for the 17 over this? Well, one, I was issued those Glocks in the military or the government, but I would choose it anyway because of its operating system. Now, this is the next thing you need to understand is how guns operate. Very simply, a magazine inserts into the magwell, which is similar to here with the bullets facing forward. And you have a chamber, which is basically the barrel of the gun. As you pull the slide to the rear and you let it go, it chambers around actually in the chamber, but it's actually the back of the barrel. In this example, you can see it right there, just that open space. I mean, I can even show you. If it was sitting in here as a check, you could see the back of the brass. That's the chamber. That's an open chamber. That's a closed chamber. Now, for a gun that's chambered, it's very simple to understand the process here, or the cycle of operation. I pull the trigger, it goes boom, it hits the primer, sends the bullet, 
you get combustion taking place in the chamber and then it has nowhere to go, which reciprocates the slide to the rear. That process extracts and ejects the brass and recycles the next round off of the magazine into the barrel to repeat the process. This is called semi-automatic as a cycle of operation where it chambers, I fire, cycle of operation takes place, combust, extracts, ejects, and that process starts all over again with the reset of the trigger. So that's important to understand because that's very simplistic. But a lot of guns now have different types of safety mechanisms. Back to the compact HKP7. So this HKP7 has a unique feature not common to many firearms that you have to grab the grip of the gun, which gives you that little nipple on the back end as an indication that it's ready to fire. It's called a grip safety. As you grip that, now you can pull the trigger and fire it. Without that proper grip, you're not gonna be able to fire it. Why would they do that? Well, one, it has a lot to do with the German police. Uh, a lot of companies, including Beretta, a lot of the overseas manufacturers design these guns for police officers. So the trigger weight, the safety mechanisms are built in primarily for police. I like that mechanism because I could have one in the chamber ready to go, but have this in a bag, not worried about if the pin gets you know, jammed in the trigger well and fires the gun because it's flopping around in my bag. So one, I always recommend that you, you have a round in the chamber, I mean it's ready to fire. But a lot of these pistols with these different safety mechanisms have means of making the weapon ready to fire. Like I drop uh, the thumb safety or I, you know, I, in some pistols, I remove the thumb or remove the safety and put it on fire. Those mechanisms for me as advice to you are not recommended. I want you to have a weapon system that when you draw the pistol and present that gun to a threat, that the only thing you have to think about is getting proper sight alignment and breaking a shot on that target. Um, if you overcomplicate the systems, you'll find yourself working around potentially defeating safety mechanisms. A great example was a 1911. A 1911 has a grip safety and a thumb levered safety that you drop. One time I was shooting an IPSC competition, international uh, practical shooting competition, and I drew the pistol and didn't have a good grip on the pistol. And so when I pulled the trigger, I thought I had a malfunction. And so I slapped it, racked it, and tried to go back to work, and it didn't work again. It was because I didn't have a good locked grip safety, and I mistook that for a malfunction. When you're fighting for your life in milliseconds, uh, where every, every millisecond counts, that mistake could cost you your life. So I prefer single action pistols. SIGs are known for being both double action and single action. This is very easy to demonstrate. I think a lot of people overcomplicate this. A double action pistol requires two actions, double the action. So if this was double action, what you would see when I pulled the trigger is you would see the hammer move with the trigger and then slam forward with a complete pull of the trigger. That's a double action. That SIG, name a model 220, for example, it's a 45 SIG. Once it cycles, it will now keep the hammer to the rear, which means it's only one action where I pull the trigger the next shot and the hammer just goes forward, forward, reset, forward, reset, right? Versus it's stowed and then I'm double action coming back, one action and forward, two actions. So most of your wheel guns, your cylinder driven cycles uh, of operations are typically double action or single action, right? Where a single action cowboy gun will only fire by you dropping the hammer and releasing it in one action versus a double action format where you pull the trigger and the hammer goes back one action and goes forward two actions. Forget all about that. If it's confused, confused you, just take the advice. Buy a single action only pistol, Glock, including 
this SIG P320, um, there might be a proprietary thing that's not called SAO, single action only. That's the best practice. One person would probably argue with you, maybe many tacticians would argue with you that single action is better um, because in single action, you have a shorter throw in the trigger pull. That can be true. Um, also, the double action, some people would argue that a double action is good because it's safer. All this idea of being safer because of the length of the trigger pull or even the weight of the trigger pull is bullshit. Ignore that. When you're committed to a gunfight, meaning you're going to pull the trigger to save um, your life or your family's life, in defense of your life, what you're not thinking about is poundage. You're pulling through, right? So there's not a justification for um, overcomplicating that cycle of operation in the trigger. Have one single action where you pull the trigger and the gun goes boom. Have a round in the chamber prepared for that action and have this stowed away in your waistband uh, somewhere readily accessible. That's the bottom line. Um, people have asked me, hey, is a wheel gun, is a revolver a good option? Yes, if it's hammerless. I think one of the inherent fault, well, one of the problems with the wheel gun is the lack of rounds that you can carry in capacity. And an old timer would tell you, well, you just don't miss. Well, that's okay. If I have five rounds, for example, in a Ruger LCR synthetic framed 38 plus P revolver, I only get five rounds. If there's three bad guys, I'm in a world of hurt potentially. So having more rounds in a gun is beneficial. Um, real quick digression, a lot of old timers will argue with you that you always wanna have a 1911. It's because they grew up with 1911s. They had a point at one period of time, which was 45 ACP was more effective than nine mil. That is until we developed synthetic bonding and materials that were super efficient at killing people um, in nine mil. Now you're talking about 900-ish feet per second versus 1100 plus feet per second. A 1911, seven to nine rounds. I have, this is a, 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 a SIG magazine that's 21 uh, rounds plus one in the chamber. That's a lot of nine mil, a lot of security and a lot of capability. So don't over, overthink this. Nine mil is a great round for self-defense. It's used all over the world. Just consider the ammunition that you're using in particular. This is full metal jacket. I use that because it's my everyday carry. And I think about being around vehicles and shooting through glass and shooting into glass because of that. So if this was a home defense round, I'd be using a serrated hollow point type synthetic bonded round that would not over penetrate drywall or even people and cause maximum damage on, on flesh as opposed to material. So this is a material round. So that's the level of detail that I'm paying with this kind of setup. So here's what I recommend you do if you're trying to get your first pistol. Buy a Glock 19, just do that. Not The 19, the Glock 19 is going to meet 95% of everybody's um, or maximizing everybody's potential. It's the proper grip, even for me with, with a fairly large hand, it's going to fit your hands. Uh, even the small guys with small hands or small gals with small hands. And you're going to be able to manage the muzzle flip and the recoil, the rearward movement of the gun in your hands. You'll also have 15 plus rounds available and you'll be able to get as many accessories for that pistol as possible in nine mil. Remember it's 15 plus one and it's chambered in nine millimeter. There's nothing to overcomplicate there. One thing of note for people, because I've, I've argued this and debated it with people uh, over the years, these guns are not zeroed to you. If you're like me, I'm right-handed, but I'm left-eyed dominant. If you want to find your dominance, you could simply uh, find an object. Like I, I'm looking at my, I'm looking at the, the reflection of the picture behind me, making a little sliver with both eyes open and then I bring it back to my face, keeping it in focus. Yep, by golly, I'm moving to my left eye. Now, eye dominance has nothing to do with acuity or 
the, the level of capability of that eye it has to do with dominance, meaning your left eye or my left eye is picking up. So when I take a pistol and I'm right-handed and I drive it forward, I have to push it out over my left eye. A lot of people have asked me like, how do I over, how do I compensate for this deficiency? One, it's not a deficiency. The top 10 shooters in the world at any given time, probably 30% of them are cross-eyed dominant. So it's not something that's going to disable you. The thought that you would tilt your head and turn into the front sight to, to pick it up, it, it, don't do that. Keep both eyes open, present the gun over your left eye and push it, rail it. Instead of here, make it here. If you're seeing double vision, then you need to train your eyes to see uh, with one. The easy way to do that is take a pair of sunglasses and take your toothpaste and smudge out the eye that's going to be open, but it's not going to be your dominant eye. So you could pick up that front sight with that left eye without um, disrupting or taking that eye out of the fight. The reason you have both eyes open is because you can maintain better situational awareness. You're cutting your vision field in half by blinking one eye. Totally appropriate for shooting bullseye targets at distance, not appropriate in self-defense. Um, lastly, let me talk about subcompact versus full size. A lot of people think less is more. If I have a very small gun that's concealed, that is going to be the pistol because um, it's covert. Nobody knows I have it. What you have to understand is when you sacrifice size, you're increasing a couple things that will grossly affect you, even me with a larger hand. Most pistols, because they gas off and, and throw the slide to the rear, you're gonna get profound muzzle flip. With a good grip, you're gonna maintain um, the pistol in your hand and reduce recoil. Remember, muzzle flip is this. Recoil is this. So I get this action and this action. I could stop that action, but this is going to happen. The snapping of position going pop, 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 pop. We want that to happen. But what happens with subcompacts, because it has a shorter spring and buffer inside of the slide, once it gets shorter and shorter and shorter, it's going to affect the your ability to maintain control of the recoil because it's so much energy transferring in your hand that the, the pistol is gonna come to try to dance out of your hand. And that takes an aggressive grip. Well, look at my hands. Like, this is a, a compact. Even with a full size, like I could swamp this gun. Well, if, it's be, if I'm trying to bear down on the gun because I want a better grip on the pistol, and it's a subcompact, let's go back to the P7, then what's happening is I'm overbearing the pistol. And potentially, I've seen it happen on ranges, inducing malfunctions, failure to feed, failure to extract, you name it, you'll probably induce it. So you want a good balance of being able to control the lower end of the gun, which is called the frame, which is this independent area versus the, the slide that you need to allow to operate in its cycle, because that's the part that gets you to a new round. This needs to happen. This needs to have control. If you can't control it because your hands are too big or even too small, you're not going to be able to manage the pistol, which is going to affect not only accuracy on target, but also speed. Speed is developed by the efficiency of the gun. Muzzle flipping, recoiling, coming into position fast. That efficiency is going to lead to good outcomes. Look, there's a lot of overwhelming things when it comes to uh, choosing a pistol, including I'm scared of the pistol. There's a course that we're doing on February 27th in Heber City at our headquarters using simunitions. Simunitions, in fact, they're the same pistols. Simunitions are pistols that are built, that operate the same, to shoot primed rounds that extract and eject the same and cycle the same, shooting a plastic projectile that in some cases can be um, dyed which means you could see the impact or judge the impact. Why is that important? Because you need to build the confidence in something before potentially going onto a range and making bad habits or mistakes because you weren't trained. Uh, when I grew up with pistols, we did a lot of what's called dry firing. So I was comfortable with manipulating the guns in my hands. Do you have a gun? If you do, get comfortable with the manipulation of that, of that gun. But if you want to get better at shooting, there has to be a start point. 
that simunitions breakdown is, is a very good start point. If you want to do this on your own, look online for a replica or an airsoft gun that's made to the same specs as the gun you carry and practice. Get used to holding it. Get used to being safe with it. Get used to manipulating the gun and that will make all the difference when you go to your first training course. This little series is just about building confidence for you guys and talking to the basic shooter or maybe even the intermediate or expert who wants to reinforce good habits. If there's anything that you guys wanna hear in the future, leave it in the comments. If you like what you're hearing and you want to tune into it, obviously subscribe. Uh, this stuff that I do on YouTube, I don't do it for monetization, I do it for education. The more that we can educate you, the more likely, selfishly, that you're gonna to come to us to train. I want, I want to see you have the confidence to come train with me and Kevin Owens. That's okay, but it, we have to start somewhere. And that doesn't start with sitting in your living room, staring at a gun, not understanding what, what to do. It starts with, with education. So I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I uh, appreciate you guys. If you need anything, hit me up. Till next time. Later.